If you, on the other hand, have a ongoing chronic illness or something like this, and you're having to work in that system as a way of life, you understand the current medical system is a total and complete disaster. There is no common sense whatsoever involved. But what happens is when, when the teacher is constantly calling you out, the, the other kids see you as a problem. They don't know what a 504 is. They don't know any of these pieces behind the backstory and they just think you're that kid. There's also some bullshit. So like you kind of have to be careful, but every one of the kids are different. Like, you know, here we got a kid who's literally going to school with other kids that quote unquote have the same challenges. And yet they're all so different. It's the problem. Said to the podcast, hey, th today I am not running this. She is. So this should be a little list. It's very different because all the other times when he's running it, it's more that I just let him think he's running it. But we all know that's not accurate. So I'm going to take my glasses off. I'm probably going to get a little emotional today in our topic. But I wanted to talk about something that's really raw, timely for us, and emotional. That is having a child with neurodivergence, aka ADHD and all the all the spectrum diagnoses, delayed puberty, just all these learning differences, learning challenges, and how it impacts not only our marriage, but just our family dynamic as a whole. So we live in Arizona and we have no businesses in Arizona. We moved here for a reason for our son to go to a school to be supported for his learning differences. It was a very big um, undertaking, a big investment, financially, emotionally, and psychologically, all the things, and moving a family of five. And here we are, um, two and a half. Wait a minute. I, I thought I thought we moved to Arizona so I could play golf. And well, we've not played much golf. We played a lot more golf in Idaho and Colorado than we did ever in Arizona. <laughs> but yeah, we have a son who's 16, going to be a junior in high school, and is not like other 16 year olds and how that is such a beautiful thing the way his mind works but then how we can see him struggling with peer relationships brotherly relationships at home and all the challenges that come with that so i just thought i'd ask you some questions on how let's talk about how we deal with that um <laughs> or this feels maybe like a setup if somebody would want to drop a comment below <laughs> How would you recommend we deal with this or how do you deal with this? Well, I mean, I think that's a thing, right? I mean, I think first and foremost, you are not alone for those of you out there. Like this is, there are a lot of kids that are diagnosed with a whole variety of different challenges. Uh, we like to try to call them, um, you know, learning differences, but it, it is a disability. There are, they are special needs and you know, for those of you, you know, it's, it's I, Y, K, Y, K, right? Like, if you know, you know, you know exactly what we're talking about, you know, exactly the challenges and, you know, it's, it's a lonely place sometimes. And I know there's a lot of people out there, but it's not something that gets talked about very much. So when, when was first diagnosed? You remember when he was first diagnosed? I don't remember when he was first diagnosed. I remember when I first realized that there was something wrong. Something different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was before he was diagnosed. Um, so he was first diagnosed when he was five years old because he couldn't sit still in class. Um, teachers would, you know, have circle time and read their books and Quinn would be up walking around the class, going playing over here, going picking up toys over there and just never paid attention. And the whole Vanderbilt survey where does your child have a hard time sitting still? Do they fidget in their chair? Do they act as if they're driven by a motor? All of those things were true for Quinn. And so... I'm stunned. Right. And so we were like, okay, now we have a diagnosis, a reason why he's so antsy, so fidgety, hard to sit still, hard to like corral, if you will. He's the kid that, you know, I dress them both the same in identical clothes. And I used to joke that half the reason is because then I could find them because Quinn would always run off. And so I'd at least have Cole and say to a stranger, if you see another kid, have you seen a kid that looks just like this one? But, um, but what did you know? What did you think ADHD was? What did you know about ADHD when Quinn was first diagnosed? You know, I honestly, I, I, I really thought about my brother. So I've got a brother who's seven years younger and, and sort of some somewhere between my age and his age is when they started really talking about ADHD instead of like when it was 
in my era, there was no really, I'm going to diagnose you and I'm going to medicate you. you. You just figured out. And so I was, was, I had to work harder than everybody else. I didn't get the grades that, that other people that would study, you know, a 10th time. And then my brother was diagnosed. It was, you know, it took him longer to put his socks on. I can, I can remember that being a frustration for me. Like, trying to go, I would go into his room, like, what are you doing? And he'd still be putting his socks on. They have to get their socks on just right. <laughs> and and he was given more time to be able to do things, right? So he, he had extra time to to do homework and do tests and that kind of stuff. That's really what I thought we were talking about. Right. And I mean, for me, I mean, I just thought this was just hyperactivity. This was somebody that had, and it's not an attention deficit, which cracks me up that they call it an attention deficit disorder because there is no deficit of attention. It's a surplus of attention. They just have too much attention for too many different things. They can't focus that attention. We did initially medicate him at five years old, and I remember feeling like the worst parent, but to me, it was a temporary solution. I wanted him to experience immediate positive benefits from it because I was worried about him constantly being schooled in a class and then feeling like he was the bad kid and then being late by his peers and other students as the bad kid. So that's why we initially put him on medication in kindergarten. And then when was it? Second grade when we took him off and we did a whole host of testing to see if there was anything else besides ADHD because it was just getting worse, not better. I mean, on medication, he was definitely better. But we all thought, gosh, it sure does take away his personality. And he's this funny, goofy, kind, compassionate kid. And he would just kind of almost be zoned out but be able to focus. What was that experience like? you remember when we took him off meds? <laughs> well, I don't remember in se- second grade taking him off meds and, and that. I, I remember I was adamant that we were not those parents. We were not going to put our kids on medication. And you and I had a conversation. We said, all right, we'll just give it a shot for a week or whatever, whatever the time period was. And I just remember seeing the change in him and his ability to be focused and, and be, quote, unquote, more normal acting. And I remember just crying that, that like, here I was. I felt like I was the bad dad because I was saying no to medication. So I think it's funny that you think you were a bad mom yeah. because of medic- medication. Oh, yeah. They, they tell you no food dies, change your diet, change all of these things. Um, but I just wanted I wanted to do all those things, but I wanted to have just really immediate results. Yeah, the other thing to that, though, like, is part of that diagnosis is they only eat things. Like there's a, there's a texture component to it. There's a color component to it. Like we, we tease that he will only eat things that are beige. And maybe some of you out there know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm sure you do. So, you know, it's, it's great to be able to say, oh, you got to take out the processed foods. You got to take all these diets. Well, at some point you also have to keep them alive. Right. Part of that is food. And like, how do you even do that? Like some of the things he just flat wouldn't eat. He, and you would be like, well, if he gets hungry enough, he's going to eat. Yo, like- yeah. Did not. So I would have to sneak in things to smoothies like spinach and MCT. Well, yeah, but and then if, and if he saw me, smoothie is not perfect. That it's not going to be. But if he saw you, even if it tasted amazing, but he saw you, there's something in that little brain that just. So, navigated. You know, elementary school, middle school was rough. It was rough, and that's what precipitated our move. So, in middle school, when you don't fit in. You fit when you fit out. They don't leave you alone like they leave you alone in elementary school. If you fit out, you have a target on your back. That was bad. that was rough. And so he experienced, and this was post COVID too. So every with that was struggling with mental disabilities and mental disorders and um, depression. And teachers are coming back from being uh, uh, teaching online, and they're teaching to ten different avatars. They're kind of in shell shock post COVID. And so he had such a target on his back. He had kids telling him on a daily basis to kill himself. Why are you at school? You're going to amount to nothing. You're such a loser. And I just remember telling him, like, I don't care what you, how successful you are. God willing, our company that we worked really hard for continues to be a success. And all you have to do is be a kind human. That's all I want you to be. And I had no idea the magnitude of the bullying because of COVID, we were just working like crazy until I was starting to be able to peel away a little bit more from the business to when he finally opened up to me and just this kid who doesn't cry, who doesn't 
he's he does he holds his emotion in so much unless he's throwing a complete epic temper tantrum which if you have a kid with adhd you understand what those meltdowns are like and he just unleashed and i found out kids were making nooses for him out of paper towels in shop class people kids were kicking him in the private parts and to like pain he was threatened with a knife so many things and then he had teachers telling yelling at him to put his toys away that were his fidget toys that actually helped him focus and so then he's got even you know turn bright red and feeling like he was being picked on and made fun of by teachers and not supported by them and then the kids were laughing at him it was like one thing after another and his we just watched this kid who was just confident in his goofiness and felt we always made it cool to be weird and we would think God for his ADHD in our prayers at night, he would thank God for ADHD to he just started to withdraw and we started to lose him. Yeah. And so lights went out. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the bullying, like, listen, I, I got it. And at some point, even as adults, like there's bullying going on. Like I get bullied, I feel like on a regular basis. So to a certain extent, like figure it out and up, I suck it up. I don't mean to bully. I know, right? But, but, but I, I did, what I, what I remember being a real challenge was that, that he was, he was the bad kid in class. Right. And so, and, and listen, for all you teachers out there, like, God bless you. You, what you are doing is like crazy, amazing stuff. Um, and you've got 35 kids in a classroom and you've got three of them that have got some learning differences and they're on a 504 plan or whatever. And yet you still have to teach the other 32 and that distraction from the three or two or whatever, um, is a real problem. But, but what happens is when, when the teacher is constantly calling you out, the, the other kids see you as a problem. They don't know what a 504 is. They don't know any of these pieces behind the backstory and they just think you're that kid. And so as a result, as soon as they get out of class, they, that's the dog they're going to kick. And he got kicked a lot. A lot. I mean, he started resorting. He would bribe kids with food and he would steal things from that cafeteria to give to kids these energy drinks. All the kids were drinking. Uh, they sold in middle school, which is also, that's a whole other. And they, uh, he would steal them to give to their kids just to get them to not pick on him, not kick him. And maybe just maybe they'll like me. And so we're looking at this kid who's got the lights going out and all of the beauty in him. So we found the school in Arizona and it was like the answer to prayer. We tried every which way we could to basically negotiate with, bargain with God. Are you sure we have to move everyone to Arizona for this? But we felt. Begged, pleaded with God. Please, no, this is not the answer. Please, please, please. It just seemed crazy, but we're looking at our son who was not only told to kill himself, but he was now at that point contemplating hurting himself. And middle school's so freaking rough anyways. And then you add these learning differences in. And so it was a whole other ball game that we were navigating. And so we felt like we had to, well, if we, we didn't move, we didn't know, we, we expected the worst. And so we felt like we were saving his life by making this move. And so we came here got him in this new school and everything's been perfect ever since. It was, I mean, it really felt amazing at first, right? I mean, you know, we made the move. There, there was a lot of sacrifice that was made. The, the, the other boys are the ones that paid the heaviest sacrifice. Um, you and I paid a mighty sacrifice, both, both actual money, but also an, an actual payment. So, you know, in stress and now here we live in a place where now I, I, I have to travel in order to work kind of deal. But we saw the the return on that investment, and all of a sudden his grades soared and his confidence soared, and how he he got he got student of the month I think mean, twice in his first semester. Like these are things that you just wanted to keep him out of jail. Else, and he had he finally had his first friends, like actual friends, that were inviting him to do things, and he had not experienced friendship like that, intentional friendship, ever. He was invited on things because of his older brother, and so you just invite the little brother. But, um, but not to mention the sacrifice that before we moved the whole family, we lived apart to make sure the school was a great fit. And so 
we were apart during the week as a family and together on the weekend. So the kids only had one parent and you and I would spend a week apart. The kids would only have, they'd at least have one parent. I know. It was really hard on the sex. <laughs> Very hard on, uh, yeah, on our emotional um, connection and our intimate mm -hmm. connection. Not. And I'm really bad on the phone. Like that was, that was tough because you're a talker and all I wanted mm -hmm. to do was get on the phone. And it's lonely and you're raising, you know, we're running two households in two states and you're running a company and trying to be a parent and we have a kid who's a freshman in high school and found out later he's like cutting class or, or golden child is cutting class like half the time. So everyone, it was, it was a struggle. So we got here. He did great for that first year. Um, and then I don't know. I mean, it's just, I don't know. So what are some of the daily challenges that we struggle with as a family having someone, so having a child with special needs? So it was great for that first year. And then it was almost like he started regressing. And I don't understand, I still don't understand all there is to know about ADHD. And I'm sure people even that are experts in, in ADHD venture to say that there's so much more to learn. Anything that impacts the brain, it's just such a vast field of science that is probably barely scratched the surface up. Um, and so thinking that we have this figured out and then He's got delayed puberty, like very delayed puberty. So now he's on testosterone shots. And he's seen an endocrinologist and seen a, a therapist and um, going to this school. His grades start slipping. He's getting in trouble. He's having academic challenges as well as social and peer challenges. And we're like scratching our heads going, what, what are we doing wrong? What, like, what else can we do? Yeah. Is there a question? Well, the question, like, what? How's how's it impacting us as a family? How would you I'm not sure how it's not. I mean, you know, like you go you go through as a parent, like the workload associated with helping somebody with that kind of a learning challenge is massive. Which you know, you'll, you know, yeah, we all have the same fourteen hundred and forty minutes, right? So figure out what you're going to do with them. And then when you've got two other kids that also need the same level of attention and love and care and that kind of stuff. And, oh, hey, when there's chaos in the house, it doesn't just impact that one person, it impacts everybody. And then, oh, hey, by the way, when that chaos happens and the temperature of the house is not where you want it to be, the the amount of effort that goes into trying to, to create that environment is sometimes I'm incapable. And then there's the, the, the exhaustion and that there's the emotional roller coaster. And then there's the, the guilt associated with I, I can't fix this. And then there's the guilt of, you know, like every time I lose my shit and I am not the parent that I need to be for him or the other boys, you know, then I've got that guilt. I mean, listen, it is, yeah, it's, it's real. It is real. I keep saying it, that it's been a full-time job taking care of Quinn's medical needs, trying to find, you know, the, the right therapist, the right endocrinologist, getting into this doctor point at these lab results, going... We, we went off meds for about six months earlier this year because of the shortage. So if you have a child who's been on ADHD medication and then you understand the struggle is real trying to get these medications, and then this dose isn't available, but it's available on, in the generic, but not the name brand, but your doctor wrote the name brand. And so you keep having to go back to your doctor to say, I need you just to write a blanket prescription for Vyvanse or other generic medication and and if it's not available in this dosing, I have to know that in advance so I can get them to write the right prescription for the right dose. It, like, that's been a, been a nightmare, absolute nightmare. And so, the medical system is broke. Like, I mean, if if all you're doing is having to deal with like when I'm sick, I go to the doctor. God bless you. You're amazing. You don't understand what we're talking about. If you, on the other hand, have a ongoing chronic illness or something like this. And you're having to work in that system as a way of life. You understand the current medical system is a total and complete disaster. There is no common sense whatsoever involved. And the other piece, to, so in addition to all the medical care and everything, and then the advocacy. I mean, if he was in a public school, forget about it. But he's in a school for kids with learning differences, and I've had to advocate so hard for him. And thank God that we've got such great administrators at that school that really truly come have come along and partnered with us and they see our son if he wasn't my son i would not like i i certainly wouldn't love that child um 
they see him, they see his heart. And that's something I can't explain to anybody else. And people do look at him and think, what is wrong with him? I'm sure sometimes. And there are times that he behaves in a way that I am horrified and mortified and his brothers as well, his his relationships with all of his family members have at one time been strained or non-existent. Um, and then you look at him and he, and you can see that he's hurting so much and he, he can't even tell you why he does some of the things that he does. And I can't even begin to explain it as a mother or try to even ask the right questions. Um, so it leads me to this question, how important is it to have a support system when raising a child with a learning difference? But what is our support system? I mean, thank God for the school, right? Thank God for friends and that kind of thing. I, I think the hard part is that there isn't much of a support system out there. If you can get yourself into a school where there are other kids and other families that are struggling with the same thing. But I would say that even even the school that we're going to, there's no connection with the parents. Yeah. The kids are from all over town, so it's not like you're you're in a neighborhood school like one of the other boys where, where literally they live down the street. So Right. They, yeah, it's an hour round trip to each way to take him to school. So it is definitely a sacrifice. But also, thank God we're still married. I can't imagine if we were, there was one parent having to deal with it because when you are losing your shit, then I can come and be the calm in the storm so we com- don't completely rush our child or tear him down to when we are just over, just beyond ourselves and vice versa. When I'm just ready to lose it and my head is spinning, um, you're able to come and be the calm because there's so much chaos and he brings so much chaos. And trying to understand the ADHD brain, what is what is a resource? What is a book that you or- podcast or what are resources that you've learned some things from? I, well, I've, I mean, all, all kinds. Like, I mean, there's, there are great books. I love the pen um, book. The that, Wilderness Family. Yeah, that, that is so good. I mean, only halfway through it, but that's like, that's so funny. I'm laughing at myself from that book. Yeah. Uh, but 